Hello, and welcome to the Authentic Wednesday podcast. Each week, my guests and I share our vulnerable behind the scenes stories of giving ourselves permission to take off our masks, let go of expectations, and embrace our own path of freedom and authentic connection. I'm your host, Bianca Hughes, a lover of authenticity and a licensed professional counselor in Georgia. Hello and welcome to episode five of the Authentic Wednesday podcast. I promise you guys, I'm so excited that you are here. I'm so excited for this episode that we have coming and the guest who I have. I probably did this part of the podcast where I introduce about four times. (laughs) It's just all part of what happens. Nothing is perfect. When you're listening to this, it is all edited. I just want you guys to remember that. So just as we're always on authenticity and imperfections, but I just want to thank you so much for joining. My guest today is Justin Patton. His aim is to inspire social change through creativity. He believes that self-fulfillment only comes when we can embrace who we are, free from the idea of who society tells us to be. Justin is a poet and he's also the author of Poetry for the Hopeful. And I have listened to his poetry. So let's get into the conversation. I am so excited to have our guest, um, Justin Patton, on the show. Um, I don't even know where to start. He has so much to say, but um, welcome, Justin. And thank you for being on the Authentic Wednesday podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited. Uh, like I was telling you before, uh, I knew just speaking to you briefly, you know, you think different. So so I'm excited to, to have a conversation with you for sure. Thank you. So I just want to give you guys a heads up. I met him at a poetry show and um, he was doing his poetry and he said something. He was just so raw and so honest. And one of the things that caught my attention was him um, saying that he used to, as a black man, he kind of wanted to be white in a way and and emulate white people, but, or the white man, shall I say. Was that correct? Did I say it right? Yes, yes, yes. 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 But, um, and just how he's evolved and discovered himself. And this, Justin, does so much discovery, um, which is just so awesome. So I guess just your truth and hearing that, what does authenticity mean for you? Uh, authenticity for me is being yourself through and through uh, when it comes to speaking your truth, when it comes to living your truth, as in making decisions for you, you know, more so than anyone else. I know we all have responsibilities and things that we have to take care of, but at the end of the day, I don't feel like I'm able to, like, for so, for instance, I just got married. So, for instance, I don't think that I could give her what she needs unless I give myself what I need. So, uh, so just loving yourself and, and being true to who you are. And, mm. uh, and I know that's a discovery for a lot of people. So, uh, so even just seeking, just seeking yourself, you know, trying to find out who you are. To me, that's where authenticity starts. Love that, but you weren't always authentic, were you? No, no. But, um, <laughs> How did you get I, here? Well, I didn't, um, and and I'll say, like, it's an ongoing thing. Like, it's it's always a struggle. It's always a battle. And I know for me, it was uh, for me, it was kind of just circumstances growing up. Uh, uh, like you said, um, I touched on like wanting to emulate white people. And that wasn't anything like I was conscious of as a kid. It was just one of those things like growing up and looking back on it, like, wow. And that's just comes from a product of, you know, being raised. Um, you know, of course I had my family, but I went to a Catholic school where, you know, kindergarten through eighth grade, there was 15 black people in the whole school. And three of those were me and my two sisters. So, um, so it was, for me, it was kind of like circumstances. Like I remember thinking like, we got done playing outside. Like I wish like I had hair that like moved when I ran, just like little stuff like that. And then, I mean, even going to church, like literally seeing, you know, the, the photographs of white Jesus there at church. And it's almost like, you know, where's a, uh, at least when it comes to religion, you know, where's, where are the black people, where are the black people at? And it's not until like you get older 
till you realize a lot of the stuff that you were taught was whitewashed and you kind of had to unlearn that. So even like history lessons, you know, the first thing we taught was, you know, we were slaves. Like we just <laughs> came out as slaves. Like there's nothing before that. And, um, you know, the, our only saving grace was Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And uh, actually, I won't even say Malcolm X, it was Martin Luther King. And that's kind of just how we were taught. So it was just like a combination of all those things growing up. And then, uh, of course, like the pressure of going to college and, you know, the thing is to get a good job and, you know, just ride that job out as long as you can, make sure it has good benefits, you know, and I did all that. I lived the way, you know, my parents wanted me to live or whoever, you know, I went to school, I got the degrees, I got the job. And then ironically, you know, when I graduated, I was fired twice and laid off. So, you know, it didn't take me long to see like, okay, I'm going to have to carve my own path and not listen to anyone if, wow. uh, if I'm going to be a success in the way that I want to be. And, and that was how the spoken word thing came about and, and just the writing as a whole. And so, so it was the firing of the job that kind of made the change? Uh, or the was, awareness, shall I say? That was a big part of it yeah. because it's like, you know, like I said, like you're taught to do all this stuff like this, this and this. And that's the way. Mm-hmm. And then you realize, you know, when something like that happens, you know, that's <laughs> that's not going to work for me, you know. So Right. There's another way. There's exactly. another way to do it. It doesn't exactly. always have to be like A plus B equals C. There is another exactly. way. I know people look exactly. at my people and me look at like crazy when I go in the store and I ask for something. And they're like, this is not how it's done. And I'll be like okay, well, you can't do this, this, and like, no, ma'am, we we never considered that. And I was like, well, can you? <laughs> they always look at me like I'm crazy um, because I always think of there has to be another way. There can't just be one way to do something or one way to be. Um, exactly. And there's so many people that go through life just like living this mundane, like, yeah. you know, day-to-day routine they're caught up in their routine so they're just doing the same things every day and get stuck in that cycle so and so um so I just have to say you guys have to go to his website which I will give at the end because he's got some great writings um one of the things that I was reading about was the journey for self-love like where did you find the courage to finally say you know what I'm going to love me. Um, and um, and let me see. We were talking about uh, my Voyager interview. Um, and- your vo- Well, your Voyager interview is good too, but you have one on your actual website and it's called, a, uh, it's titled Self-Love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm familiar with that. Um, but that's, um, it kind of started out of, uh, let me see, I use the word depression, but I think it was more sadness because I know there's a lot of people that are, you know, clinically depressed and they have to take like meds and anything. And I never really had to take that. So, um, so out of like a a very deep sadness and, and just like, um, when we were talking about like growing up and having all these different pressures and, you know, not seeing myself in my religion and my history and all these things, like it felt like there was a time in my life where all that stuff just kind of, collided with each other and I was just in this like complete sadness and it was oh man it was nothing more than my friends and family you know of course um you know I pray and things like that but my friends and family were really the ones that uh were able to help me see the good in myself but I also had to seek that so like I asked my friends like you know what my strengths are what my weaknesses are And even, uh, you know, one of the toughest things I remember, like I went and asked one of my friends, like, yo, am I too soft? Like, do people run (laughs) over me? And, you know, as a man, like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to equate yourself with soft, you know, but, Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that was one of the things I had to look in the mirror and see, like, you know, am I letting people take advantage of me and things like like that. So that's where it started. And like I said, even self-love itself is a continuous journey for me. Self-confidence was just something that I always struggle with. You know, if it would be, if we would be in a circle just having a conversation for some reason, I'd be 
nervous to put my opinion out there. Uh, but, you know, now I realize, you know, my, my ideas are just as, val- as, just as valid as, as anyone. Mm. So, uh, so when it comes to self-love, I think it came to a point where I decided, you know, I'm going to actively love myself every day. And I'm going to do that by doing the things that make me happy. So, for instance, you know, I love to write. Let me write more. I love to work out. It makes me feel good. Let me run, work out more. And so those are things that, you know, being around my family makes me feel good. Let me make sure I block this time out to spend with my family. So for me, it was about finding a roadmap to self-love. And for me, that was doing the things that I genuinely enjoy every day. But even still to this day, it's a, it's a continuous journey. Uh, I'm not sure if there's ever like quite a destination, but uh, but I'm thinking I'm getting better at this. <laughs> I don't think there is a destination. Um, gosh, you got so many things. Let's see. Um, some people struggle with that finding, like, you know, I know you said you found what you love, but people even struggle to find the things that you, they love. Did you always know what you love to do or did you have to kind of figure it out like trial and error? I had to figure it out. So when it came to, when it came to writing, that was something I knew I was always good at in school. Uh, when it came to poetry specifically, I had always written poetry. I didn't really realize that it was something that I wanted to pursue until I was in um I was in a sunken place, if you will, sad time in my life. And I was writing a lot of poetry. I had a friend come over to my house and he was like, um, he found some stuff that I'd been written. He was like, yo, man, I'm I'm reading the stuff. I know you wrote poetry. I'm like, yeah, you know, every now and then, whatever. You know, he was like, it's pretty good. You should do something with it. And I'm like, eh, you know, I didn't <laughs> think much of it. And then about uh, a year later, he told me that he had a friend that was putting on a poetry show and everybody that he had planned to perform there backed out. So he asked me if I could get up there and read something. And so I was like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll give it a try. And uh, And I did that. And I was completely embarrassed because I got on stage and forgot everything. And oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. And I, I felt stupid. But um but I was like, okay, I suck, but that was fun. Uh if I could have got my point across the way the way I wanted to, then I think they would have enjoyed it. And so I just kept uh kept going for it after that. And then probably maybe like a few weeks after that, I was at my parents' house and my mom gave me a bunch of stuff from like stuff from like elementary school, middle school that, you know, cleaning out of the house she wanted to get rid of or whatever. So she's like, take this stuff, get it out of here. I don't want to see it. So, you know, I was just going through it, looking through some of my old papers and things like that. And I seen I had turned in, um, I had turned in a book of poetry. I guess it was for like a project or something. This is like in the sixth grade. And I was reading through it like, man, did I write this? So I Googled some of the words because I thought that the poems were so good. It didn't seem like I had written them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, got a, I got a two of my own horn. But, but honestly, I thought they were so good that I didn't know I had written them. So I Googled the words to make sure like it wasn't song lyrics or anything. And I couldn't find it. And I'm like, okay, I wrote this. Like, I've wow. been doing this. And wow. so at that moment, it, that was like, okay, you know, this is something I should at least go for. And so, um, so went for it, started performing more. Uh, wrote a book and it's just been rolling ever since. Oh so my god! It definitely, it definitely wasn't something like, oh, I know what I wanted to do. No, I had, I had no idea. You know, up until you know, twenty five, of what I was doing with my life. But, uh, but that gave me some direction, and uh, and just all those things uh, helped me. Okay, I want to write. I want to mm. make writing my career. So, so that's where I'm at right now. Cool. So 25, you figured out. I'm glad you did because I didn't. I'm glad you figured it out because I didn't figure it out until in my mid 30s. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. It's, yeah hey, every, you know, it takes everybody, you know, it's different it's, time. It's, but it's but like, a lot of people don't even figure it out. Then. Some people yeah, are still figuring it out. Still like, figuring it out. You know. So it sound, you said a couple of things um, that it sounds like you have a great support system. Um, I do. I, I do. I have um, I have great friends, and luckily, I have a pretty uh, close knit family when it comes to you know a great relationship with my mom and dad, my mm-hmm. older sisters and cousins, uncles yeah. and aunties. Like we still get together every now and yeah. then. So 
I was definitely blessed with that. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. You know, when I talk to um, my clients often, you know, and they and I talk to them, I always find out what their support system is like because the support system, and it doesn't even have to be your family, but just having right. a great support system really helps the process in um therapy and even it sounds like your support system was the one that kind of said hey you're a great writer and really like helped you because sometimes we can't see ourselves um and I read that this same friend was the one that kind of helped you out of the depression well you said sadness so I'm gonna say you said sadness but I want to talk a bit about that because you said sadness and you wasn't sure about depression because of um, you know, not taking medication. And I always just want to stress that it doesn't even have to be taking medication to be depressed, you know, in okay. depression. Um, yeah. And that people think, oh, it has to be something that you're really, really sad for a long period of time. And I'm like, no, because the onset and the symptoms can really be like a two to three, two week to three month period. Like it doesn't have to okay. be long. And so sometimes... Okay. Okay. We don't, you know, sometimes as people, we don't always reach out to get the help because we think it has to be okay. this, this major thing. So I'm not diagnosing you, you, but okay. I just wanted to share that just for anyone who's listening um, about that because we do say sad and I also find, especially in um, with mental health, especially in the black community, it's hard to say that word depression. Um, just yes. the, there's I, so, I agree much, with that. so much shame because, yes. and it also led you to, Think about suicide, right? Your sadness. Yes, yes. Um, what happened? And it was, um, it was really just. I felt like the spirit of death was just like was just in the air at the time. Like I had, um, at the time, I had my grandmother, my uncle, one of my aunts all die in the same month, and that was just a rough time for my family. My uncle kind of died unexpectedly. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my My grandfather, her husband had died probably like a year before. So just for the whole year, she was already just like outside of herself. Like she was, to me, she was already gone mentally. You know, once her husband died, it was like, Mm. you know, a a piece of her died. But, uh, But even still, they were all kind of unexpected deaths and they all happened at the same time. And during that time, I was just having a tough time. Like I said, just trying to figure out who I am just trying to carve out my place in the world. And I felt worthless. Mm. And I did feel like I felt stepped on. I feel like I wasn't seeing, I was trying a lot of different things and I just wasn't seeing any success in anything. And I mean, even I was in college, but that still wasn't even like, I mean, college for me was always like, I knew I was going. So I didn't feel like big accomplishment just being there. But, uh, you know, just being broke and just struggling. And it was just a tough time during that yeah. time. And like yeah. I said, having, having a lot of family members die at that time, just the spirit of death was just kind of just in the air, I felt like. And so I went and I bought a couple bottles of cough syrup because I had been drinking that a lot to, to help me get to sleep. And I'm like, okay, if I just drink this bottle, let's just see what's going to happen. And I drank the bottle. I drank the first bottle, and God, I just I don't even remember how I felt. But um, but I was just laying on my floor, and I didn't have enough strength to drink the second bottle, so I just went to sleep. And I just felt I just felt like crap, and that feeling lasted, you know, for a couple of months at least. Wow. Um, yeah. So. Did anyone probably, know? Did anyone know? Um, no, no, I, I didn't tell anyone, uh, even up until the interview I did was the first time that I'd shared it. And really that was the first time that I'd sat back and contemplated on it. Like, wow, that was, that was a time in my life where I seriously thought about suicide and taking my life because I didn't think, I didn't think anyone would care. Wow. So you didn't tell anyone because you didn't think they would care. I didn't tell them because I didn't think they would care. And I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want anybody to like, I didn't want to become like a charity case. I didn't want people like, you know, calling me every second to see what's going on or anything like that. And I just felt embarrassed. Like, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I always know like it's people that have it worse or whatever. And I'm like, you know, maybe, 
maybe my problems are perceived as that bad. But, you know, to me, it, it feels like I have no purpose in the world. And wow. So it was almost like, what's the point in being here? Wow. It just makes me think about all the thoughts that were going on and all the stuff that you were telling yourself. But how much of that was actually true that nobody cared or, you know, you would have been seen as a charity case or you had no purpose? I was kind of going through a period where I was drinking a lot and kind of experimenting with drugs. So there were a lot of things kind of playing on my mind. You know, it just wasn't uh, I didn't have much clarity at that time okay. just because, you know, I was rarely sober. So, uh, so there were also a lot of outside factors, I think, that were giving me that anxiety and fuel on the fire, I would say. Did alcohol become your friend? Alcohol was my friend, um, <laughs> amongst other things. <laughs> amongst um, other things. Mm-hmm. Amongst other things. Um, definitely alcohol. A uh, few drugs here and there. But yeah, alcohol was, was a big thing. Mm. What was you seeking in alcohol? I'm not, I guess just an escape. Just an okay. escape from from reality. Yeah. Um, you know, it kind of, I guess it makes you, uh, it just makes you sedated. So mm. you feel less. You feel less. And I had just got into a point where I just didn't feel anything. I didn't feel emotions. I wasn't too happy. Wasn't too sad. Wasn't too angry. Wasn't too, I wasn't anything. I was just kind of numb to everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so now, even in my relationships where, you know, I might, um, you know, I might argue with, with my wife as, as we all do from time to time. And she's like, God, you, you know, your emotions are, you know, whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, I understand where you're coming from, but I remember there was a time where I didn't feel anything. So I would, I would much rather be a little bit more emotional than normal than, than being numb like I was. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I just remember being completely numb to everything. Wow. I saw you even wrote a poem about that too. Um, yeah. Just about the, the, the alcohol and, and coming through that and things like that. So you guys should check that out because I did listen to that. It was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I did so your I- research. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> that's I, awesome. I don't know who I'm talking to. Um, yeah, that's awesome. One of the things, um, and I'm wondering if this came into it as well, because you wrote a really good um, blog on um, porn being sex education and um, for you and um, the different things, how porn impacted you. Was that still an impact during that time as well, or had you overcome it by that time? I wouldn't really say I'd overcome it, but it wasn't a thing at the time. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't really a thing at that time. Okay. I loved what you talked about, that porn was your sex education, which is like total crap. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. The worst thing ever because it's so not real. And so there is so many different conversations around porn. And um, I was just reading your whole um, blog on it. And I definitely think that's another good one for you guys to read. And someone had um, said that, you know, the world's so sexualized, but yet we don't openly talk about sex and we don't openly always talk about porn, the impact of porn, the addiction of porn. And one of the things, right. right, And one of the things that was really, really interesting was that you read that how it kind of took away your confidence to talk to to, to talk to women. Oh yeah. Which was really interesting. Can you tell us some more about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, my parents and no, um, no knock to them. I just think they come from a different era. You know, um, I'm sure that, you know, their parents didn't talk to them about sex. So, uh, so I never really had, you know, sex, sex dialogue with, with my parents. Like I said, no knock to them just because I don't think they come from the era where, you know, that was something that we were having conversations in Mm -hmm. our house. So, um, and so, you know, I didn't really know anything about sex other than what I heard in rap songs, what people were talking about in school. And then, uh, of course, uh, I grew up when the Internet came around. So, you know, porn was <laughs> with the Internet came a lot of porn. 
And so that was kind of one of my, um, that was kind of one of the things where like I cleared, okay, that's six, <laughs> you know, that's one of the things I understood. Okay. That's what six is. And so, you know, I'm seeing guys with like these, you know, 12 inch penises and like these, <laughs> these ridiculous, you know, like these ridiculous fantasies going on, on, on these videos. So in my mind, that's what sex is, you know, girls screaming, going crazy. And then, you know, maybe it is for some people, but you know, it's like this completely like fantasy version of what sex actually is, you know, to the point where, you know, physical things, like I said, I'm, I'm seeing all these guys with these, you know, massive body parts. So I'm thinking like, oh man, that's how, <laughs> that's how it's supposed <laughs> to be. So, <laughs> you know, how can I live up to that? So, so yeah, that, that lowered my confidence talking to women. Like I was very, I was very timid just because like, I didn't think I could live up to what I thought sex was supposed to be. And, you know, that wow. that carried on for, you know, for a while, like pretty much like almost towards like, you know, the middle of college, like towards the end of college. Like that was that was a big thing. Yeah, that was a big thing for me. And I think um, and like I said, it was one of those things where in the moment, like being young, growing up, I didn't realize what it was doing. But it's one of those things you grow up and you realize like, wow, like, you know, that played a big part in in what I thought about myself. Uh, the confidence I had and even just my whole my whole thought about like what sex is and, and how it comes about, you know, that played a very big part. And uh and, wow. and I'm sure I'm not the only one with, with porn more accessible yeah. now. And so um and so in that article is definitely a conversation I wanted to bring up because I feel like even now still no one really is talking about the effects of, of porn on, you know, young people. So I know it had yeah. had a big impact on me. Yeah, I never I I know the, you know, the impact it has on the brain, you know, being a, you know, therapist and, you know, when it comes to addiction and the patterns and, you know, of course, the dopamine, because, you know, sex sex is a natural thing and a pleasurable thing. But when it becomes distorted, that's, you know, that's the challenge. And then it is it's, you know, it is natural. I think someone also said um, I was I was at a. Uh, training and I actually said not to call it porn addiction because it was um I think it was more of a disorder it's kind of like eating disorders when you think about we have to eat and it's like you know we also have to have sex as to say it's an addiction to say you have a food addiction it's kind of difficult because you have to eat you know you can cut away you can cut away alcohol and you can cut away the drug so I think it was um miss sex discount you know sex addiction but so with the also the porn as well so it was um you know I know it distorts the brain um and you know that's where you begin to get the pleasure the pleasure from and I also like because you put women in there too so women also have <laughs> challenges with porn so I appreciate that you put that in there because women okay. do watch porn yeah. and do also struggle as well with that and then have this expectation right, right. so I just want to talk about the women too and I was just going to talk about the men <laughs> okay but um, I never really considered or realized the impact that it would have on the confidence. And so it was interesting because I also shared a post recently that, you know, sex is not a performance. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, is, it's an experience and right. it sounds like for you, you are putting it more on, you know, performance Absolutely. and attaching like your sense of worth to, which is very normal for men. Right. Their sense <laughs> of worth is attached to, you know, sex and, and into jobs um, and just like women are relationships. So it sounds like it really impacted your sense of worth and kind of like also distorted that based on performance. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you could perform or not, it's, it's sounding like. Yeah, which yeah is, definitely, definitely. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I haven't, yeah. um, like I said, like, I know I'm not the only one. Um, no, so, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you're not. So, yeah, so, so, I think uh, it, so I just wanted to put it out there. Like, you know, that's, that's the impact it had on me. How did you overcome it? For those people who are not the only one and are listening and are like, well, okay, well, what do I do next? Cause if I'm putting on, you know, people who are putting their confidence on their Compare, comparing themselves to porn. Right, right. Uh, for me, I overcame by talking about it, by writing about it, by putting it out there, 
Um, and then, you know, I start to see people, oh, you know, this, this is a thing. Like, you know, people are talking to me about it and I was more open about it. And so when you have something that's, it's been behind closed doors for so long and then you put it in the forefront for other people. And so other people know what's going on. So they're able to hold you accountable and things like that. Then, then it becomes like, it's not like a taboo thing because I think a lot of things we do behind closed doors, it's like, it's uh, enticing because it's like, it feels good to do something that we're not supposed to be doing. So, you know, so we're kind of just attracted to that, but like, like I said, putting it out there, like how I feel about it and my experiences and sharing that kind of makes it less taboo. So that kind of helped wow. me like kind of get over. It. And then just that awareness of like, wow, you know, porn was my sex education. Like being aware of it was, was the first thing for me. And I'm not even wow. sure how that came about other than, you know, I, I do a lot of reading and things like that. So I mean, I'm sure it came like through some book or something like that, but, um, but yeah, that awareness is where it started. And then as more I talked about it, the more I put it out there it was kind of like, yeah, and it just kind of like faded off. So. Mm. Who did you talk about it with first? Myself. If, <laughs> if that's a thing, like uh-huh. I wrote about it and I put it in my book and my editor the guy who had first read my book, he's probably the first one I talked about it with. You know, we talked about how that was an interesting perspective and, and he hadn't heard it put like that before. So I think he was probably, and he's my best friend as well. So he was probably the first one I talked about it with. And then um, in my book, it's uh, it's like one of the first, one of the first things that I talk about. And so, you know, as more people were reading and hitting me up, they started talking to me about it. So it just came kind of... Um, kind of more and more a thing like family and friends mostly and then wow um, yeah that's dope that's so dope oh my gosh like have you got so you've got a poem on it yes yes I do okay it's um okay it's in my book poetry for the hopefully it's literally the first yeah the first poem in the book okay okay yes I'm gonna have to check that out (laughs) yes 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 I need you to talk more about it <laughs> more <laughs> and more <laughs> right yeah it's, uh, it's a big conversation it's especially like you know we don't think like it's a we forget that it's one of the most powerful industries you know porn influences a lot of things and a lot of behaviors but yeah you know, we don't even think yeah. about it so I'm surprised like it's not more of a conversation in the forefront especially how yeah. we sexualize everything so yeah yeah, yeah, so I'm surprised yeah. like these conversations aren't going on more. I really am. Why do you think that? Why yeah. do you think you know we're not having them? It's interesting that yes, it's so sexualized, um, but there's still this sense of shame around sex. It's like I have to, you know, have a friend and we were having a conversation one time and she was like, you know, doing it. I was like, doing it? What do you mean? Oh, sex? <laughs> She's like, yes. <laughs> I was like, do not ever use that word with me again. <laughs> <Doing it. laughs> and so it's like it, it's like, you know, it can't be spoken. Okay. And I think, you know, what you said is your parents didn't teach you, but if you're, you know, if we think about, you know, I even think about myself, it's like, well, just wait. Don't don't be quick, just wait. Right. That's it. When you go into school, it's talked about, okay, this is sex is more talked about on being safe and this is how you have babies right. versus this is an experience that is pleasurable. Like also for me as a woman, we're not talked about being a sexual being. Um, so there's that shame around it for women, but we're also, it's always about, you know, the man and how much sex he wants and we just have to please him. Okay. So there's yeah. also all this shame and these mixed messages and these incorrect messages around sex. Um, And so people just don't talk and it's miseducation, right? And so if it's continually passed down that miseducation, then it doesn't change. So I feel like, you know, you and myself have to be the ones who, um, change us. I had another friend and he was worried about talking to his daughter about sex and we were just talking. He was like, you know, it, and I was like, what is it? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, no, you know, <laughs> right, right. Um, and my 
I love one of my little nieces. Like she knows all of her body parts. She's like, that's vagina, that's breast, that's mm-hmm. the penis. You know, simple, basic stuff like that is yeah, so that's important. Key. You know, using the correct body parts, talking about the pleasure and enjoyment, talking about how yes. both women and men can enjoy it um, versus just this thing this thing right 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 yeah you know? <laughs> yeah yeah and so and i think so it's just changing the language and being brave and courageous and being open about it because everyone does it and that's how we got here so exactly. why are we not exactly about it? exactly yeah and and so. you mentioned, and you mentioned shame <laughs> uh, you know and while i'm thinking about it i grew up catholic so you know it was a sin to um to have sex before marriage so I think that's mm-hmm. one of the things as well. Like, you know, it's, it's a uh, seamless, shameful, you know, just having sex mm-hmm. before marriage. So, so I think that mm-hmm. probably plays into why people don't talk about it as well, especially like the more religious. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I don't think sex is talked about, like, it's just sex is a sin. <laughs> like, no, it's, you know, this pleasurable thing that God, because right. I'm definitely, you know, a, a, a Christian myself and it's a pleasurable thing that God has created. Do I believe in sex before marriage? Me personally, no. Do I understand that everyone else has sex before marriage? Yeah. Do I have a problem with it? That's your choice. That right. has nothing to do with me. Right. And so I think that's you have to separate the two. That sex, there's this thing of the church and the sex is before marriage. And you know, if you believe that, okay, but sex is not a sin. Right. Right. It's two different things Absolutely. that we're actually talking about right. the sex before marriage and then sex itself yes. and i think yes. that they yes. in within the church they get caught up as the same thing yeah and so but everybody's in the church is having sex anyway <laughs> because you don't talk about it right. so it's right. like you know and it, i think people believe if you talk about it that people are going to do it yeah and yeah just talk about it exactly just, yeah we need to it's know. important it's important <laughs> people need the education yeah they do so that's what i think yeah shame and just being open and i think that's why you know me and you were having this conversation why i do this podcast is that when we're speaking our truth like you talk about when we're being authentic Mm -hmm. then we begin to have these real conversations and things change exactly we're no longer hiding you know um and i think there's something that you know when we stop hiding which it sounds like is some of the things you've done i know mm-hmm. i've personally done once we stop hiding and speaking our truth um as hard as it is then that's when we become more open and that's when you know change is made um right. i think as you can see you speaking your truth is when change is made so, yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely so that's yeah. the purpose at least so <laughs> so um gosh it's such a good conversation and i almost got to wrap up with you so um <laughs> one thing i did want to ask you um that you talked about and i think is so so key is forgiveness of yourself oh yeah yeah and, and that's, how um, what does that look like for you? It's not beating yourself up about it. It's not. Mm. Um, it's not holding against yourself. It's not. It's not putting the chains on yourself to where, like, you know, I can't move forward because I'm, you know, basking in my sorrow because I did something. You know, we all make mistakes, and we're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna mess up. We're gonna choose the wrong answer. We're <laughs> gonna make wrong decisions. As long as things aren't, as long as things aren't malicious, then, you know, and and I mean, even to a certain extent, even if they are, you know, we should forgive ourselves. But, um, but yeah, so forgiveness for me is like allowing myself to move forward, allowing myself to make mistakes, because even in in that way, I can live more free if I'm not, Mm. you know, Mm -hmm. worried about, uh, you know, this could be wrong, this could be wrong, because, you know, anything could be wrong. You know, and a lot yeah. of times I can project that on situations and I'm not trying to do that. So forgiveness for me is just allowing myself to move forward and not beating yeah. myself up. And that's, yeah. uh, like I said, it's, it's a constant battle now, but I'm definitely a lot better with it. I'm a lot better with it. How does it feel to be you now, today? <laughs> How does it feel to be me? 
um, it feels good because even just talking to you and having this conversation, I've been pretty blessed to overcome some things. I mean, with help, of course, with, uh, you know, help from my creator uh, and of course my friends and family, guys, without them. Yeah, I've been able to overcome a lot of things. So it feels good to be in a point where I'm getting more towards my authentic self. And, and like we talked about, I think, you know, that's a constant journey. But but the fact that, you know, we're even having this conversation right here. So I think even someone else can recognize it, you know, makes me feel good. So I feel I feel blessed. I feel like I'm content, but, you know, not satisfied. Still uh, some mm-hmm. more things I want to accomplish. But as far as um, as far as being myself. It feels good. And, and there, there was a time in my life where I wasn't excited about waking up and being in my own skin. So to say that now is, is definitely an accomplishment yeah. for me. So, uh, so yeah, it feels, feels good to be wow. alive. Wow. What is the message? If there is a message, what would that be that you'd want to get out there for people to know listening to uh, this? If there is a message that I want people to get across, be yourself, because that was was one of the hardest things that I had to learn and still learning because, you know, it's a lot. Society puts a lot of pressure on us to, to do certain things from our friends and our family and, you know, career choices and choosing our spouse. And, you know, there's mm-hmm. so much pressure put on us. Like it's a, it's a battle to be yourself. You, you have to fight to make decisions that are for you. But when you do that, people recognize it and the right people start coming into your life and good things start happening because, you know, I feel like you're telling the universe, like, I want to be myself. So I feel like the universe will help you with that if if that's the truth that you're living in. Yes, I love that. Cool. Thank you. So one last thing. Do you have any resources um, that you would like to share that have helped you along the way? Any videos, podcasts, any um, books that you've read that have helped um, you? Oh, gosh. There's been a lot of things. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, uh, I'm big on Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, of course. But uh, but my favorite book by his is called Warrior mm-hmm. of the Light. And okay. that's a book that, you know, it's uh, kind of a resource for me even now to go back. Mm, okay. And, um, yeah, what it really means to be yourself and walk walk your own path, so to speak. Um, okay. Let's see, what okay. else? Uh, let me see. Oh man, there's there's so many things. Um, uh, I still um, <laughs> I still go to church every now and then just to make sure you know I'm getting the word in, and um, and I just think it's uh, okay. important <laughs> for you know for a group of people to be worshiping, you know, for okay. for one cause. I, I think there's power in that. Um, so, of course, uh, you know, trying to find the spirituality that, that works best in your life, whatever that may be. Um, you know, praying is big. I meditate. That helps a lot. Uh, being centered. Uh, mm. Let me see. Oprah, Super Soul Sunday. <laughs> she, got, she got me straight with a few interviews. Um, <laughs> And uh, oh God. Uh, if you wouldn't ask me, I could think of like, like a million books, but um, but let me see. I'm big on music, um, so there's a lot of um, mm. a lot of good artists. Gave me some good wisdom out there. Common is one of them. Like a lot of his stuff. Um, but yeah, anything, um, anything that's for self progression, self help, yeah. things like that. I'm pretty okay. much for it, and I'll give it a chance. So, and now your podcast will be mm-hmm. um, <laughs> on my list <laughs> Thank now you. of uh, of one of the things to <laughs> to you. help me and, and give me insight. My last question would be: Where can people shower you with love? Um, they can shower me with love on my Instagram at I am Justin Patton. You know, like a picture is cool, but if you send me a message to tell me that you like something that I posted or something that's always important. Let me see all my blog posts on Medium. You can just go to medium.com and type in Justin Patton and you'll see all my articles. Um, YouTube, Justin Patton, Spoken Word, whatever, search that. Um, You know, like my videos, share those. Um, Let me see. And uh, also my Instagram, I'll be posting dates to where I'm performing. So coming out to a show is, uh, is a big thing. You know, if uh, if you're in the Atlanta area um, and also hopefully I'll be coming to a city near you. So 
uh, all of those things are, are a good way to find me and, and show some love. Okay, wonderful. So all of that information is also going to be put in the show notes so you guys can contact and reach out to him and go listen to him. I've definitely heard him and he is amazing. Thank you. Thank um, you. So thank you. You're welcome. So thank you so much, Justin. Um, and we will meet soon again, yes, I hope. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> thank you, Bianca. I appreciate it. You're Take welcome. Care. In this episode, we discuss suicidal thoughts and depression. If you or someone you know is experiencing suicidal thoughts, please call your local emergency number or go to your local hospital. If you or someone you know is in need or seeking mental health services for things such as depression, please contact your local mental health service provider in your country. If you connected with what you just heard, please subscribe, rate and review the podcast. You can stay connected by following our Instagram, Authentic Wednesday Podcast, and visiting our website, AuthenticWednesday.com. Remember, authenticity is a journey, not a destination. 